Hi, my name's Geoffrey Braithwaite. I'm Professor of Health Systems Research at the Australian Institute of Health Innovation in Sydney, Australia. I'd like to thank Caroline and Jonathan for inviting me to give this talk. And um, I'm sorry, we can't be together, but these times of the pandemic mean that most things are done virtually. And I think we've all become used to that. So uh, maybe one day soon, we will uh, have the vaccine and be able to travel again. So when I discussed this with Caroline and Jonathan, uh, we talked about the fact that a lot of my research has been in the health system of the future and the characteristics of healthcare, which uh, make it unique in many respects compared to other industries. And we talked about the fact that a lot of people who were hospital planners, architects, engineers, policy makers, people who want to create um, the healthcare of the future could benefit from some of the work I've been doing. So we've entitled this Resilience in Healthcare, a Systems Perspective, but really what I'm going to talk about is the nature of healthcare and how it is changing and what we might need to do to factor in some of the changes in um, build, how we build a new, a new health system in the next 10 years. So um, I'm from the Australian Institute of Health Innovation. That's a large bunch of people in Sydney, Australia, a couple of hundred of us, all doing research on healthcare nationally and internationally. Our mission is to heal, learn and discover. We provide care to patients in my university, in my faculty, we have our own hospital and uh, we have our own clinics and uh, uh, outpatient uh, services. We also teach medical students and public health students and we do a lot of research and my research institute is a case in point. So we run through the spectrum of heal, learn and discover. My institute has quite a lot of centres uh, that make up the institute itself. There are three university centres headed by a professor, myself. I run the institute, but also I'm director of the Centre for Healthcare Resilience and Implementation Science. I'll be drawing on some of that material for this talk. Enrico Coera is a doctor who became a health informatician. Uh, he's very interested in artificial intelligence, big data, um, connectivity of health systems. Joanna Westbrook's an epidemiologist. She runs our Center for Health Systems and Safety Research. She's very interested in aged care and evaluating uh, IT systems and uh, working on informatics from that angle. We're also surrounded by a lot of National Health and Medical Research Council funded centers in sustainability, keeping people out of hospital, looking at tracking the care to aged care cohorts, uh, looking at implementation of, of uh, better evidence into cancer care, uh, digital health and digital support for aged care. So we've got a lot of centers and projects, all of which um, are about really creating an, an improved health system across the next 10 years to 2030. Okay, so let's ground ourselves firstly. We're in the midst of a pandemic. That's affecting everything. Research, the provision of care, how we build things for the future, um, how industries work these days. And so there's a lot to be said about that. I don't know if you know, but um, as, I lay down this, as I lay down this talk now for you, there are over 70,000 papers in PubMed, the big medical database uh, of uh, all the papers that uh, have been ever published, there's 27 million of those, there's over 70,000 papers with COVID-19 somewhere in the paper. So, um, uh, and it's only November, so we haven't been going on this pandemic uh, for nine months yet. Uh, so I'm gonna draw on some of our work, but just to let you know, there's a lot of papers, articles, chapters, uh, studies, uh, published already on COVID-19. So here's our study. It's the 40 health systems COVID-19, the 40 HSC-19 study that we just published a couple of weeks ago in International Journal for Quality in Healthcare. 
This analyzed what was happening in 40 health systems as they all deal with the pandemic. And this is very interesting because the pandemic is going to go on for some time to come, at least a year or so. Although, you know, at the time I'm laying down this talk, there's been three uh, groups that have uh, uh, demonstrated some efficacy in a vaccine, although the vaccine has yet to be produced in a uh, large scale or, or delivered to populations. Um, but still, we have to deal with the pandemic as we find it without a vaccine right now, and perhaps for at least a year or two. So we looked at all the countries in this 40 country study. And essentially we looked at three different angles. One was pre-pandemically, what was the capacity of this country to respond? Did they have a good plan? Were they prepared for any pandemic not knowing that COVID-19 was going to be the pandemic they'd have to deal with. Secondly, how stringently did they respond? How fast did those countries respond? Um, did they do mask wearing and social distancing and quarantine if people got symptoms? Um, did they do all of those things fast or did they take some time to get organized? And the third thing is, what was their approach to testing? Did they test narrowly, i.e., we will just test specific groups. We will just test, for example, health workers on the front lines of care, essential people. Or we will just test aged care facilities and the people in them. Or did they, that's narrow testing, or did they test broadly, i.e. let's make a test available to anybody who wants one. Even if they're asymptomatic and are feeling well, they just feel a bit nervous, so let's give them a test. Because if you do that, enough people in the population will know what their status is. So which of those three things do you think are the most crucial? Having a really good plan for any pandemic before the pandemic arises, Dealing with the pandemic and stringency, mask wearing, social distancing, uh, closing down uh, cafes if necessary. And did they test broadly or narrowly? So we mapped all these countries on government capacity to respond and stringency of pandemic response against those and broadness of testing against those three uh, factors and put this into a model into a model and there's the 3D on the right hand side, there's the 3D model of all the countries that we included in our study. And you can read this paper, it's on open access, you can go and find yourself a copy or if you can't email me and I'll send you one. So we, does, we then were able to assign all the countries in the study, all 40 of them, to one of these five clusters. So uh, cluster one was where uh, there was low levels of stringency and narrow testing. Cluster two was high levels of stringency and medium testing. Cluster three, medium levels of stringency, broad testing. Cluster four, high levels of stringency and medium testing and low and narrow for cluster five. And this was against the first box across those clusters, which was the box that said, were you prepared in advance uh, for uh, your capacity to respond? Did you have an inherent organized pre-pandemic capacity to respond? So those were the three variables, C -c government capacity to respond ahead of the pandemic, uh, stringency and testing. And these are where all the countries uh, uh, landed when we assigned them to these five groups, or rather they assigned themselves to these five groups by virtue of their performance with COVID-19. So the countries that you would like to be would be Australia, Iceland, South Korea, and Taiwan. They essentially did stringency quite fast. They did broad testing right across the community and they had pretty high capacity government capacity to respond 
The other countries were the gold group, which had, as again, high capacity to respond, uh, a pretty high stringency and medium testing. And other countries such as the blue group had really good inherent capacity to respond. The US is an example where they've done lots and lots of practice for a future pandemic in earlier years, pre the Trump administration. But they lost that capacity for various reasons uh, to actually respond when the pandemic came. Um, and the UK and the US, which we all know, uh, are, are in that group. Um, uh, and it was a great shame that they lost that capacity to respond by not responding very well. Um, and other groups are assigned differently. We also clustered this with these spaghetti diagrams to show in the 61 days from 1st of March to the 30th of April, which was the crucial time for the pandemic, how were cases traveling across those 60 days? And this is the crucial incubator period where you really have to be uh, um, making fast, rapid decisions and be on top of your game. And if you want to see more of that, I've kept these, uh, uh, these in there. These are the national health systems in terms of cases. Um, uh, these ones are, are uh, daily new cases. The other one was cumulative. And then we've also done deaths per million population, uh, cumulative deaths, and new daily deaths. So we're able to map across time against these clusters to see performance. And once you know your own country, you can have a copy of these slides, and these slides are drawn from the paper that we published. You can have a look at your own country and see how well it's going and how it's assigned to the group that it's in. The second study we've done is that's about clustering at the country level. The second study we've done is we've surveyed 1,131 people across the world, across 97 countries, all whom are on the front lines of care, the actual people delivering care to patients, not so much policymakers or how countries responded to uh, the uh, pandemic, but how are people on the front lines of care dealing with it? Do they have enough PPE, personal protective equipment? Um, and this was later, that other study that we did was during the incubator period of March, April. This is now later. This is now in July, August. How are people dealing with the pandemic on the front lines of care? So in that case, we surveyed 1,100 people. Uh, three countries uh, responded more than others, Italy, Australia, and India. And we looked at, did the pandemic responses by this time in the global pandemic, did they change by countries and who were World Health Organization regions? And had they adopted measures which we now all know you should adopt if you want to tackle this pandemic well? Here's one graph. There's lots of data in this, um, in this study too. And this is on open access in International Journal for Quality in Healthcare. Here's one graph where we graphed by uh, WHO region, World Health Organization region, the African region, the Eastern Mediterranean region, the European region, the Pan-American region, which is North and South America and Central America, Southeast Asia and Western Pacific regions. These are the way World Health Organization classifies its countries. And you can see that um, the reaction time for infection prevention and control Ye um, uh, months later into the pandemic, uh, uh, more than halfway through the year 2020, uh, there's still a difference in responses about whether healthcare organizations can respond very fast or are more slow in responding across the world. Um, and so although the world has learned how to deal with the pandemic, in some healthcare organizations in some countries and regions, they're not doing as well as others which is a bit surprising because it's now really well known what you have to do if you want to tackle a pandemic. So our results are that early stringency measures and national capacity to deal with a pandemic are fine, but they're not sufficient on their own. Extended stringency measures, when you basically lock a country up, for most countries, 
they have deemed that these are important, but they're not economically sustainable. And so we have landed on, with our studies, the results that broad-based testing, testing everybody in society, everybody in the population who wants a test, because enough people, if they get tested and know their status, will do something about that. Not everyone, but enough people will. That's key to managing COVID-19. Second part of the talk, now that I've um, talked a little bit about my uh, evidence-based views of what we should do during a pandemic, rather than say, political views, which some countries are still dealing with the politics of the pandemic rather than the, uh, the science and epidemiology of the pandemic. The next bit is about future of health systems, and this might resonate with you as well, I hope. So we published a paper um, on the future of health systems to 2030, a couple of years ago. And this came out of a very large book I, I edited uh, with um, 148 authors in a, uh, covering 152 countries. And I asked all these authors, this is a series of books I edit on um, healthcare reform across the world. I asked the authors to tell me what was happening in the future of their health system. And I, I summarized it in this paper. Again, it's on open access. So um, when you boil it all down, there are five trends that are shaping health systems of the future. One is everybody's working on how do we make the system sustainable? How do we make it affordable for all the populations that need health care in our society? How, how can we make the health system, if you like, future-proofed or built to last? The second thing is how do we exploit uh, coming technologies, particularly genomics? You know, uh, science can now read your gene and target, increasingly target, um, treatment to you, not just the disease which you have, which many people have, a more generic treatment of care. So uh, genomics is playing a huge role in having clinicians understand the characteristics of the individual uh, and the type of person they are and how their genetic makeup is likely to affect them and how that genetic makeup is likely to affect the pattern of disease that they have. So this leads you to precision medicine, targeted treatment. So the genomics revolution is in the early stages uh, and how do we exploit that across the next 10 years? How do we give people who need to make decisions about care and treatment the information on the genome? The third thing is emerging technologies. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of information technologies, IT, uh, such as artificial intelligence, which are, um, I like to call augmented intelligence rather than artificial because it augments human, it supports human decision-making, clinical decision-making. The fourth thing is global dem demographic changes. The, uh, the demographics of the world are changing, the world's aging. Um, populations are shifting and moving. They're not so much during a pandemic, of course, but travel will come back. And then fifthly, new models of care, uh, virtual care, care by telemedicine, telehealth, um, new ways of delivering care. So those are the five trends. And we uh, saw in the, this book, this now very widely read um, uh, book, uh, but you don't have to read the whole book if you don't want to. You can if you want, buy it from Amazon, but um, you can read the paper um, that summarizes it. What are people working on to try and exploit those five trends, take them, in, take them into account in their health system of the future? Well, everyone's working on trying to integrate care, make it more seamless for patients. They're trying to work on how they can afford it, the financing, economics, and insurance angle. They're doing patient-based care and empowering the patient more than they ever did. They're trying to cover the whole population, universal coverage. They're working with information and uh, technology and information technology, uh, diagnostics, new tests, new IT. They're working on aging populations. How do I cover uh, and provide care to uh, the disadvantaged and the elderly? Preventative models. They're working on accreditation and standards and policy, trying to raise the standards of care. And they're working on human development, education and training, training 
the workforce of the future. Those are the nine major things that people are working on uh, um, across time um, uh, to make a better health system. Another paper we wrote on this theme is uh, looking at transformational improvement in quality care and health systems the next decade, also published this year, 2020. Again, you can look at that for more information if you're enjoying this, if this is your cup of tea, if this is the sort of thing you'd like to factor into your own work, then uh, there's another paper that we have published. In that paper, we looked at three major reports that had been published in 2018, major international reports, and we've summarized it into this document. So what people are working on in this work is trying to improve the care systems, that's in the middle, the middle, middle two circles. They're uh, trying to obviously improve health and the delivery system. They're trying to raise quality of care. This is a global thing, not just, it's a global pursuit. It's not just um, the responsibility in country. There's a lot to learn from other countries. Um, and there's lots of examples and studies. Uh, people are trying to uh, focus on morbidity and mortality, fewer deaths. And it's about access to care for populations. So these are the major things that people are working on. Uh, here's a, here's a, a synthesis of the three major reports that this paper that I'm talking about is uh, a summary of. And here's those, those themes and concepts uh, put down uh, in terms of how, how much these reports focus on. So three things that now need to happen. I think we need a blueprint for change for 2030. And that's what this paper that I'm talking to now did, the paper in BMC Medicine. It's also on open access for you to easily get hold of. I think we need to make steps within countries and across the world to reduce inequities. There's lots of inequities within any particular country. You know, people who have not much and people who have extraordinary wealth and it can afford the best care um, uh, on offer. But also across the world, there are more wealthy countries, high income countries, and low income countries. And I think the high income countries could do a better job of supporting the health systems of the low income countries to produce more, inequ more equity across the world. And finally, I think what we've done uh, in other work that I do in the Resilient Healthcare Network, which Carolyn knows very well, incidentally, and did a PhD uh, from a world famous person in this uh, area, Eric Holnagel, um, is to learn more from what goes right, not just obsess all the time in health systems with what goes wrong. So my question is 2018 was the year of analysis and reports and a lot of work pre-pandemically. So now that we've got the experience of the pandemic and this work I've presented to you on COVID-19 and also on the health system of the future, can we make the 2020s the decade of action, the decade of getting a better health system through to 2030 for every country? There's lots of other work on this and I'll just point this out in closing. There's the sustainable development goals of the United Nations which are fantastic goals for every health system to uh, think about and look at. Um, there's work from an Australian, another Australian group apart from mine uh, uh, about health system, system shifts. And this is another way of looking at how do we get to 2030. Um, Deloitte's, one of the big consulting practices has released a paper and I'm given the website there, which is very nice. And it talks about drivers of value and uh, early identification of diseases and moving from health care, the system, to healthiness. Um, and they have five drivers of value which resonate with the work that I'm doing. Uh, but I'm just showing you that as another way of reimagining health care for the future. So that's... <laughs> What I wanted to say, my research institute actually has a couple of hundred people in it. Here's a selection of them waving to you, waving goodbye. Um, we publish, you know, th almost 350, 400 papers a year. So I've only sampled a small number 
but we have a website you can go to, the Australian Institute of Health Innovation, and there's lots more materials that we make available. So uh, if you want a glimpse of the future of healthcare, I've tried to give that to you, but if you want more and you want to factor that into your own work, please, by all means, see if we can help you come to our website. Here's some acknowledgements for the teams that work directly with me. But to be frank, I have many teams working with me right across the world um, in the Resilient Healthcare Network, uh, in the International Society for Quality in Healthcare, WHO and other groups. And here's some recently published books of mine, some of which I've drawn on. And here's some forthcoming books of mine. Uh, so keep watching and reading and I'll try and deliver more stuff for you and maybe give a talk in the future again with this very uh, useful and important. So thank you for listening. Thank you for having me. Uh, and uh, good luck with your work as we all work together to try and co-create a better health system across this decade of the 2020s to 2030. Thank you.